Since Thank you everyone for being here. Today we're gonna to do something I think is incredible. We're gonna talk about glioblastoma multiform in a way that most people don't. I don't think you'll be able to get what we're gonna to do today anywhere else. At least that was my, my intention. So today, we're, the, basically the talk is the glioblastoma multiform of patient journey. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Audience participation is always encouraged. Please raise your hand. Please put something in the chat if you wanna know anything during the talk. We will absolutely address any concerns or questions you had. So this tumor is actually near and dear to my heart. I've really only seen my dad cry twice in my life. And people have heard me talk about my dad in other talks I've given. We're very close. He's a PhD in science, a PhD in, in biochemistry. And I grew up in the lab, right? First time I saw a cancer cell, I was four years old. And that was in his lab. So I've known I wanted to be a cancer doctor since I was four years old. I think I talked about that previously in a different talk. But I've only seen my dad cry twice. I saw him cry when his mom died. This was when I was a little child. I remember that distinctly, even though that's only one of the really memories I have at that age. And I also remember seeing him cry when I was also a young child because his sister, who he was extremely close to, had died of glioblastoma multiforma. So I've known about this cancer for a long time. I'm excited today to be able to give you my opinion on it, my perspective on it. I do treat patients with GBM. I certainly don't do GBM only. I do everything. And I think that will give you a unique perspective on the trials, on the drugs. And I think you'll be able to see this from a slightly different perspective because I don't do just GBM. I do everything, including GBM. So when we talk about cancer and people have heard me say this, there's no doubt when you get diagnosed with cancer, particularly a glioblastoma multiforma, you go through a ton of emotions. That's normal. Stress, panic, depression, phobia. These are all normal reactions to a diagnosis like that. So please know that that is not atypical, that you are not going crazy, that that is a perfectly reasonable response to a diagnosis of glioblastoma multiforma. But what I'm trying to do today, what we're trying to do with these talks is we're trying to lift the curtain. We're trying to take away the fear of the unknown because that is a profound fear that people have. So we're trying to show you what your road is gonna look like, trying to remove these question marks, trying to say, hey, look, just wait. We're gonna kind of give you a feel for what the future might look like, or at least will cer undoubtedly certainly look like in some situations. And I'm trying to tell you what I would want my family member's road to look like if it was my mom, dad, brother, sister in the same position with a glioblastoma multiforme tumor. Now, what we're gonna do today I think is unique, that we're uniquely qualified to do because we do everything is we're gonna talk about the forest as much as we talk about the trees. And in fact, I'm gonna do one, better, one step better than that, right? I'm not just gonna talk about the trees. I'm not just gonna talk about the forest. I'm gonna take you all the way out. We're gonna zoom out even more than that. We're gonna talk about planet Earth, right? I'm gonna talk about the trials and the drugs in the trials based on the fact I already know these drugs, right? So there are some drugs called poly ADP ribose polymerase inhibitors, PARP inhibitors in GBM trials right now, okay? There are drugs that I've been using for the last seven years in other patients and other tumor types that are currently being studied for the first time in glioblastoma multiforma, not just PARP inhibitors, but the BRAF MEK inhibitors that they're using right now. I've been using those drugs since 2011, at least the BRAF inhibitors. The MEK inhibitors came a little bit later, but I've been using those since 2011 in melanoma. So I have a very unique perspective on this that you really can only get from a generalist. You can't really get it from someone who just does GBM because they don't really know these drugs. They're just using them for the first time. So we're not just gonna talk about the trees, which we're gonna do. We're gonna dive into the trees. I promise you, I'll give you a very unique perspective on the trees, but we're gonna back up. We're gonna talk about the forest. We're gonna talk about the country. We're gonna talk about planet earth. We're gonna go all the way out because I think you need that. And I think when you're a patient, right? The trees are gonna differ from patient to patient, but planet earth isn't. That overlying thought process, that overlying treatment philosophy is going to be the same. So we're going to talk about planet Earth because you can use that. You can extrapolate to your, your particular situation, your particular tumor, and your particular situation. So this is going to be a personalized journey for patients with GBM and their loved ones. Now, I really, really want you guys after this to go and watch that talk I gave called Optimizing Your Ability to Fight Cancer. It's so important. It lays the foundation for this. Certainly, this is a standalone talk. Don't worry if you've not seen it yet. But please, please, please watch that talk. I honestly think it's the best initial discussion for every single cancer patient the minute they hear about cancer. I think everyone needs to see that talk. I made it in a very unique way. You're going to get things you're not going to get anywhere else. And it's going to set up your foundation upon which you can learn about the rest of your cancer. 
So you can see it at revolutioncancer.com. Go to the Revolution Cancer channel on youtube.com. Today, though, we're going to talk about glioblastoma multiforme. That's why you're here. That's the show, right? So we're going to start by talking about brain cancer in general. So I always tell people, look, cancer is just a cell that grows in an uncontrolled way. Breast cancer, breast cell, lung cancer, lung cell, brain cancer, brain cell, right? When I write on a white whiteboard for every single patient that I have, I literally go through their entire disease and give them a lecture basically in their first visit on the cancer and what to expect. I literally just say to them, look, cancer is just a cell that grows in an uncontrolled way. Brain cancer is a brain cell. So there are many types of brain tumors and it's based on what cell is involved, right? So if it's an astrocytoma, that's a particular type of brain cancer. If it's an oligodendroglioma, that's a particular type of brain cancer. So you can see we have many different types of cells in our body and they form different types of cancers when they start to grow in an uncontrolled way. They behave and they are treated differently. Today, you're hearing about glioblastoma multiforme, which really is an astrocytoma that's growing in an uncontrolled way, okay? Or sorry, astrocyte, astrocyte cell that's growing in an uncontrolled way and causing glioblastoma multiforme. So glioblastoma multiforme, as are most brain tumors, are glial cell tumors. They're where glial cells grow in an uncontrolled way. So an astrocyte, which forms glioblastoma multiforme, is a type of glial cell. So we have many types of glial cells. They're distinct from neurons, right? They are not neurons, they are glial cells. And what glial cells do is they support neurons in numerous ways, but they also help aid when there's nerve injury, they help address nerve injury, repair it. They also assist in the transmission of nerve signals. Now we have many types of neurons, right? We have astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, we have ependymal cells, we have microglia, et cetera. And depending on the cell, that's growing in an uncontrolled way, that determines the type of glial cell tumor you have. So glioblastoma multiforme is where an astrocyte grows in an uncontrolled way. Oligodendrogliomas are where an oligodendrocyte grows in an uncontrolled way. Okay, so it's that simple, not complicated. Glioblastoma multiforme is when an astrocyte, which is a glial cell, which helps support neurons, is growing in an uncontrolled way. You can see here, here's the astrocyte helping the neuron just supporting its function. Now, aside from the type of cell mattering, when we talk about brain tumors, right? So the brain tumor itself, the subtype of brain tumor is completely dependent on the brain cell that's basically growing in an uncontrolled way. The other thing you need to know about, right, is the grade of the cancer. Now, let's take a step back. When people talk about cancer, we always think about stage. Absolutely, that's what everyone thinks about. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, you know, breast cancer, lung cancer, et cetera. With glial cell tumors and brain tumors, what we think about is something called grade, not stage. So what does grade mean? Think of grade very simply as being a measure of how aggressive a cancer looks under a microscope, right? If it doesn't look particularly aggressive, it has a lower grade. If it looks really aggressive and there's certain ways we determine that, it has a higher grade. So we grade these one, two, three, four, typically. This is what a normal grade normal cell looks like. Here you can see a grade two tumor. Here's a grade three tumor. Here's a grade four tumor. You can see it looks very different, right? It looks really abnormal. Don't worry about the specifics. I don't care about that today. I don't care if you get any of the specifics today. That's not what today is about. Today is big picture, giving you some of the trees, giving you a feel for what you're gonna expect, but you have tremendous oncologists, they will do the rest, right? I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a foundation. So grade four, basically is where glioblastoma multiforme lives. So this is kind of what the tumor looks like under the microscope. Now there are numerous criteria we use to grade these brain tumors and everything we talk about revolves around this. And what do I mean by that? Well, you can see it here. So when we talk about brain tumors, okay, there are many types of brain tumors, pilocytic astrocytomas, low-grade astrocytomas, low-grade oligodendrogliomas. Okay. So how do we determine what type of brain tumor you have? Well, it's based on the type of cell that's growing in an uncontrolled way. So we talked about astrocytes forming astrocytomas, and then it's based on the grade, right? So if it's a grade two astrocyte growing in an uncontrolled way, that's a low grade astrocytoma. If it's a grade four astrocytoma where the astrocyte's growing in an uncontrolled way, that's glioblastoma multiforme. And that's what we're talking about today. We're right here in this box. So that's all we need to know, right? You don't even need to know that really. You are just kind of already have a diagnosis, but it tells you how we got there. Now, this is important really, really, really important. When you get diagnosed with GBM or someone you love gets diagnosed with GBM, the natural reaction is to go straight to the internet. Everyone does that, I would do that, right? And there are studies showing that 90% plus people do that. In fact, there are studies showing that 50% of people 
when they already know what's going on, still go to the internet every single day. And they should. I would do that. And I'll talk about that, why that's true later. But everyone goes to the internet. But please know that when you're reading about GBM, you're reading about other people, right? When you've met one person with GBM, you've met one person with GBM because every GBM is different. Now, the way I think about GBM, right? I think about it along a continuum. And don't worry about the stage four, it should say grade four, okay? But I think about it along a continuum. I think of some GBMs as being really aggressive. They're over here, very highly aggressive on this aggressiveness continuum, or they are pretty slow growing. And the key here is to find out where the, your GBM is. Is it over here, kind of slow growing? Is it really fast growing? That's hard to do. You'll get a feel for that as you continue along your journey or your loved one does. But the bottom line is, your GBM is your GBM. It's not like anyone else's. So when you read, which is important, please know that you're reading about everybody. You're not reading about you. Nobody actually knows about your tumor. You're not in any of those studies, right? So you're reading about other people's tumors, which is important. It gives you a feel, but that's not you, right? And the reason it's not you is because GBMs have different sizes, different locations, different levels of aggressiveness, like we talked about, different molecular profiles. So please know that every tumor is different and no stage four, or it's grade four, this should say grade four, sorry, grade four, GBMs are the same. Location matters. So location is critically important and that makes sense, right? So when you look at the brain, there are different facets of the brain. There's the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, cerebellum, okay? And depending on where the tumor is, it has different impacts, different adverse situations associated with it. So if you have a frontal lobe issue, you might have problems with movement or reasoning or behavior or whatever. Parietal lobe, you might have a hard time telling right from left. So the symptoms associated with your GBM are strictly dependent on location. It's all about the real state when it comes to brain cancer, guys, I'm telling you, it's all about where this is located. It impacts symptom symptoms and it's a very big surgical determinant. You know, everyone knows this. I hope everyone knows this. When it comes to brain tumors, surgery is probably the most important treatment modality. Trying to take as much of that cancer out is a priority. It is, it all boils down to that, okay? It's really important. So where this tumor is located impacts how much of it you can get out. That's really important. So this really sends that message home, okay? Here's a couple of different GBMs. Now, I talked to a patient of mine who watched my very first talk. And they said that they got through a significant amount of it, but then they had to turn it off because it was a little bit too much. Then they went through the rest of it. So I, I feel like you don't have to know these details. Please don't get lost in the weeds here. That is not the point. I'm just trying to show you big picture. And to do that, I need to show you some pictures to get the message across. Please don't worry about this. Don't get lost in the details. I will walk you through it. I promise. Just stay with me. So here's the idea, though. So in this patient, there's a glioblastoma multiforma here in the pineal region. That's a small tumor. It's not as big as, say, this one, right? But this location is better than this location. Actually, this theoretically, based on the paper, was not resectable. It couldn't get this because of its location, right? So smaller than this other tumor, right? But a tougher location. So location matters. In addition, though, size matters. So you can see this tumor, very big, in a very bad location in the midline. So this is the middle of the brain. Here's the cancer here. You can see it's actually pushing against the midline. So that's a really challenging cancer to try and take out. Whereas this cancer seems to be more discreet, it is pretty big. So this is also a tough one to resect. At the same time though, it is not in this very precarious position. So I want you, I want you, when you're diagnosed with GBM, say, hey, please show me my pictures. Please walk me through the location. Please walk me through the size, okay? And do that with the surgeon before surgery, right? Before the neurosurgeon, does a craniotomy and opens you up and takes out this tumor, I want you to say to him, hey, show me the tumor, show me where it's located, make them show you the pictures, sit them down, tell them to show you the pictures. This really should say phase. That's frustrating. I put that there. I'm sorry. So the bottom line is no to phase four, or sorry, this should say a grade. No to grade four GBMs are the same, right? So with that said, many of them share the same molecular characteristics. Now, I don't want you to think about any of this. I'm only mentioning this because I felt like no talk could be complete without discussing this. You're gonna see it, you're gonna read about it. So I thought, okay, I have to at least talk about it. It honestly has no impact on your treatment, no impact on what's gonna happen to you for the most part, for the most part, okay? But I'm obligated to talk about it. So if you wanna blow through the slide or you wanna just 
turn your mind off for a moment, you can. I will walk you through this though, so stay with me. So pretty much all of these grade four GBMs are going to have a mutation in a gene called TERT, which really is human telomerase reverse transcriptase. I actually studied this gene for three years in the lab during my PhD. I literally, my entire PhD thesis was on this protein. I have three papers on this protein. So I know this protein intimately. I know this gene intimately in a way very few people on the planet do. I promise you, this thing consumed three years of my life. So the bottom line though, is that many of these patients have a mutation in the TERT promoter. So you will see in clinical trials that people are targeting this TERT gene, right? They're targeting the TERT protein. And that's why, because a lot of patients with GBM, essentially all of them, have a mutation in this gene. Okay, now you are going to read about isocitrate dehydrogenase. Okay, don't worry about it. Don't even worry about the name. Just realize you're gonna read about it, okay? And you're gonna read about these IDH1 and IDH2 mutations, which you do not usually see in glioblastoma multiforme. You see it in other brain cancers, lower grade tumors, but not typically the grade four glioblastoma multiforme, which everyone here is, is here to learn about, okay? So please know that you're gonna read about this, but appreciate that it doesn't have as big a role in GBM. Now, with that said, that said, some patients will have a mutation in IDH1 or IDH2, it's pretty rare, in GBM. And if you do, there are drugs that we use to target those. They haven't really been shown to be as effective as we would like in brain cancer, but you could certainly talk to your physician in that. Okay. The other thing that you will not see in GBM that you will read about them is deletions in chromosome one in the long arm. The Q means the long arm of the chromosome. There's a long and a short arm. Okay. P is the short arm. Q is the long arm. So this is in the long arm. And there's also a deletion in chrom the chromosome 19 in the long arm. This is typical of what we call oligodendrogliomas, a different type of tumor. You will not see that in GBM. I'm only talking about it so that you understand the rhetoric. You understand the, the lingo. You understand the vernacular. Okay, you're going to read about it. I just need you to kind of at least know that this doesn't really apply to you when you read about it. But what you do need to know and what people are going to talk about a lot is methylguanine methyltransferase, the MGMT gene. I know that you guys have been reading about this. So undoubtedly, I need to talk about it. I almost, I debated about talking about this because it really doesn't have a big clinical impact. I'll talk about it in a moment, but I think we need to talk about it. Okay. So the idea here is that MGMT helps repair DNA. Okay. So we use a drug in GBM called temozolomide. Just stay with me here. I'm going to walk you through it. We use a drug called temozolomide. It is a chemotherapy. We're going to hear a lot about it today. The other name for it is Temidar. Okay. We're going to talk about it a lot today. We use this drug to try and kill glioblastoma cancer cells, okay? And the way it works, right, the reason it does that is because it essentially causes DNA damage. That's what it's designed to do. We're trying to damage the DNA, cause these DNA strand breaks, which then lead the cell to die called apoptosis, right? So we're trying to kill the cancer cell. The problem is in cancer cells, MGMT, and actually even in our normal cells, MGMT, this enzyme, can actually repair the DNA, okay? So it can help repair the DNA. And so it basically counteracts what we're trying to do, all right? So if there's MGMT in the cell, that's not a great thing for us because we need it to not be there because we're trying to kill the cancer by damaging the DNA. So when MGMT is there, it repairs the DNA, that's a problem, okay? So what happens is if the MGMT promoter, so the promoter is part of the gene, the MGMT gene, if it's methylated, then the cell will not make MGMT, okay? So you can see that here. When it's methylated, don't worry about that. They're just little methyl groups attached to the C residues, the C nucleotides of the DNA. I don't wanna get into this, these details. Bottom line is, when it's methylated, you do not see this MGMT. It's not expressed, okay? So you want this promoter to be methylated because you don't want there to be MGMT, you want to have the DNA strand breaks and you want the cell to die. So we know that patients that have methylation of the promoter, okay, where it's essentially turned off, it's not making MGMT, we know that that is a good prognostic sign. It means you're more likely to respond to Temidol. So you're gonna see it in the pathology report. You're gonna hear it from your doctor, okay? They're gonna say, the promoter was methylated. We're going to say, okay, that's a good thing. That's good. If it's not methylated, don't worry. It doesn't really impact your treatment. So we're going to perseverate on this for a moment just so you've heard it. But when all of a sudden, I'm going to tell you to forget it. 
okay? But I do want you to kind of at least appreciate why we talk about it. So here's the thing about MGMT promoter methylation. We all perseverate on it. Like all the GBM experts, they talk about it. They all say, hey, we gotta know, we gotta know, we gotta know. Well, here's the deal though, here's the secret. Right now, it doesn't really impact what we do. We still give you the same treatment if you have the promoter methylated, or if you don't, for the most part, there are some exceptions and that's where it's really important. But when all of a sudden done, we pretty much do the same thing. And I'm gonna prove it to you right now, okay? So these are the NCCN guidelines, National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. Think of them like a cookbook, like a Bible for doctors, where we say, okay, I've got a patient with GBM, what do I do, need to do next? Like, what do the experts do, right? And they're telling you, okay, even if you're above the age of seven, right? And you are pretty functional. You have a good performance status, okay? If it's the promoter's unmethylated or it's methylated, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna give the patient temidar, temozolomide, with radiation after surgery. You're gonna do temidar after that. And then you can use these TTFs we'll talk about later, okay? But you can see it's the same exact thing and it's considered category one, which means it really was the consensus among the experts. So although we talk about it, right? We say, oh my God, we gotta, we gotta know, we gotta, we gotta know, we gotta know. It doesn't matter that much if you have a good performance status, regardless of your age, okay? Where it does matter a little bit is in patients who don't really have a good functional status and you're a little bit nervous, then you might adjust what you do a little bit. You might not give Temidar for someone who has an unmethylated promoter because they make MGMT. So you might be like, well, wait a sec. Why would I use this chemo if it's gonna make the patient sick and it's unlikely to work because the promoter's not methylated? That's where it comes into play. But in general, it doesn't make that big a difference. I promise you. Where it does make a difference is in that population I talked about. And it makes a difference because there are some clinical trials where they're using drugs only in patients who do not have methylation of this promoter. Okay, so we know that now. So that's great. That's really all I want to say about it. But the key here is please don't perseverate on this. I do not want you fixated on this. I talked about it because I had to. No talk about GBM is complete. And I didn't think that I could really convey to patients everything I wanted to do without at least mentioning this. So here you can actually see, this is in patients who are less than the age of 70. If they have a good performance status, they're functional. It's the same exact treatment, essentially, regardless of whether or not the promoter is methylated or unmethylated. Don't worry about it. Basically the same treatment. All right. So when we talk about GBM, right, patients come with different symptoms. I mean, everyone in this room knows that. But the reason the symptoms are different is because the GBMs themselves are of different sizes. They're in different locations. And that's why the symptoms are different. But common GBM concerns include swelling of the brain. Now, I want people to hear this. This is really important. When we see symptoms in patients with GBM, oftentimes it's not due to the tumor itself, okay? It's due to all the swelling around it, right? That swelling around it is impacting the brain around it. And that's oftentimes why we see major symptoms. It oftentimes has to do with swelling. I'm gonna talk about that extensively in a minute, okay? But GBM, obviously, right? It's in your brain, it's in your head, can cause headaches. It can certainly cause neurocognitive deficits. So it can affect your thinking and it can affect your neurologic function, your ability to move extremities, depending on location, right? Your ability to, to, to basically move your face, move things, you know, move your eyes, et cetera. It can impact things like that your vision, things like that, because of where it's located in the brain, okay? It can cause seizures, okay? It can cause seizures largely because of the edema around it. We oftentimes see it cause seizures because of the edema, the swelling, but it can cause seizures. It can cause psychiatric changes, right? So I have a patient now who has a GBM in the prefrontal lobe, so he's a little bit uninhibited, right? The prefrontal lobe is involved in kind of tact, right? It's involved in making sure that you're inhibited in your, your actions and your movements. So he's a bit disinhibited. He says what he wants to say, he does what he wants to do. And that's one of the psychiatric changes associated with it. But you can also see depression, you can see psychosis, you can see psych psychiatric changes associated with the cancer itself. It can cause profound fatigue. And this is something that's important. It can increase patients' risk of blood clots. It's notorious for that, please be aware. Typically blood clots in the veins. So blood clots in the big veins of the legs, blood clots in what we call the pulmonary arteries, but essentially veins of the lungs. Now I wanna talk about Decadron. You're going to get Decadron, otherwise known as dexamethasone at some point in your treatment, okay? And the reason why is because of that swelling I just talked about. So Decadron, otherwise known as dexamethasone, is a steroid like prednisone, okay? It's a really, really good drug. 
unlike prednisone, it gets into the brain. Prednisone doesn't do a really good job of that, but decadron does. And decadron very rapidly reduces swelling associated with GBM. So you're going to see people use decadron. It's really, really important, okay? And what you can see here is here's a patient with a glioblastoma multiforma. Here's all the swelling around it, okay? So you can see that this thing is pretty small, right? But the swelling is extensive. So a lot of the symptoms here would probably be due to the swelling, okay? So she gets, or he gets decadron, and immediately the swelling goes down significantly. You can see that it's much, much better. So decadron is a very useful drug. We all use it in GBM. I'd be surprised if you don't get it. There are some side effects, and they're here in red. Don't worry too much about that, but I will say it definitely can cause insomnia, can cause your blood pressure to go up, can cause an elevated blood sugar, can cause your face to be round, we call that moon facies, can cause muscle weakness typically in the proximal leg. So it would manifest with your inability to kind of get out of a chair without using your hands, right? So to do this as opposed to this, right? So to do this, you need the proximal muscle in your legs, right? And so those can get a little weak with decadron. So if you're having a hard time getting out of a chair without using your hands, that could be the steroid, okay? It can cause weight gain, a little bit of bone loss, but that's typically with long use of the drug. We don't typically use that long in GBM. We use it to get out of trouble and then come back off. But I needed to talk about decadron because you're going to hear about it. And it's a really important drug in your treatment. I want you to know why we use it. If you have a spot, GBM spot, and there's a ton of swelling around it, your first question is, hey, do we need decadron, right? That's really, really important. Decadron is so important in this disease. I needed to talk about it. I'm glad I did. Now, let's talk about managing some of these symptoms, okay? When it comes to headaches, if the headache is due to the swelling, right, we typically will use decadron and we'll use pain medications, right? So there's no way around that. Really, the way to treat these symptoms is to address the GBM, right, to kill the cancer. That's obvious. But we do have other ways of dealing with these symptoms. So neurologic deficits, you really got to treat the cancer. Again, decadron could be useful if the neurologic deficits due to the swelling around the cancer. With seizures, we use anti-epileptics. A lot of people use Keppra. A lot of people use Dilantin, right? So this is really important. You have to understand that. We don't typically use anti-seizure medicines unless patients have actually had a seizure. Now, everyone does this differently. I want to make something very clear here. I don't think there is a set way to treat GBM. There are certain things that most people should do, but there's a lot of right ways to treat GBM, right? So if someone tells you, oh, it has to be this well way, that's probably wrong. That's probably not true. Okay. Now, a lot of people have psychiatric changes. So please, please ask your physician to see a psycho-oncologist. You know, my brother's a psychiatrist. There are people who are very good at dealing with the psychiatric implications of GBM. So just say, hey, I want to see a psycho-oncologist. I want to talk about what I'm feeling. 40% of patients with cancer have depression. I think that number is probably an underestimate. The bottom line is we can take care of that. We can at least help with it, right? Let us help with it. Fatigue, oftentimes decadron will help. Some people use Adderall, some people use drugs like that. That's not commonly done unless there's kind of end of life stuff. So that's a, fatigue's a challenging symptom to address. Venous blood clots, we oftentimes use blood thinners, right? And then cognitive deficits, we typically will do neurocognitive testing to say, hey, what was your memory like before? What is it now? How do we follow it? What drugs can we use? Those are things that we oftentimes do. Now, I wrote this article for biotrend at pharmatrend.com. And I think that this article is a seminal article to really talk about the thought process behind playing chess against cancer and really against GBM in this case. I don't want you playing checkers. I really don't. I want you playing chess against cancer, which essentially means I want you thinking several moves ahead. So how do you do that? Well, here's what I put in that article, okay? When we talk about GBM, which a lot of the time is an incurable cancer, okay? Theoretically incurable cancer a lot of the time. What we typically do is we use a first line treatment. So our first treatment, right? until it stops working or a patient can't handle it. Then we do our next treatment, our second line treatment, okay? We use that until it stops working or a patient can't handle it. Then we do our third line treatment and so on and so forth. Okay, good. Now, what are the kind of treatment boxes that we have? What are, what's available to us? Well, there are several bullets in the gun. And I put that here and I think of it as bullets in the gun. I don't own a gun. I actually am not a gun person, I promise you. But I think of it as bullets in the gun, okay? So there's surgery. There's chemotherapy, there's radiation, there's the Optune device. I'm going to talk about that extensively today. There's clinical trials, immune therapy, molecular options, and other local reach options. I'm going to talk about all of this. Okay, I'm going to break it down. Please don't get overwhelmed. Just don't worry about it. This is big picture sorts of stuff. Please don't worry. Okay. Now, the way I think about it, and the way I want you to think about it, I want you to think in terms of comet. This 
acronym here. Every time you see your doctor, when there's a decision to make, there's a fork in the road. I want you to use this acronym and just run through it. I want you to say, hey, what are my conventional options? What are the options available to us based on chemotherapy that's already approved, immune therapy, things like that, conventional options, okay? What are my operational options? What are the surgical options here? Now, this may not be intuitive, I'm telling you. Like, let's say initially you have surgery, then you've got chemotherapy and radiation, and now the disease comes back. A lot of people would consider doing surgery again. Now, that's not intuitive, and it depends on where you are. It depends on the neurosurgeon. But now more and more, I am seeing neurosurgeons say, you know what, I'm going to go back in and remove this again. We didn't used to do that, right? This has definitely changed. We did not used to do that. So this is really, really important, okay? Molecular-based options. We're going to talk about this extensively. I will say the neuro-oncologists, the people who just do GBM, they were way behind when it came to molecular-based options. Options based on the genomic, genetic profile of cancer, options based on the protein expression profile of the cancer. They were way behind. We were doing molecular profiling on these cancer, on cancers in general, you know, five years before them, something like that, a couple of years before them. So it's nice to see them catching up now, but I want you to ask about molecular-based options. I'll talk about that extensively. Then we have this every, everything else box. We're going to talk about that too. I'm going to walk you through that, but that basically includes radiation, things like laser-based like laser therapies. We'll walk through that. And then we have clinical trials, right? So that's really important. The bottom line is GBM is notoriously aggressive, okay? And so when it's notoriously aggressive, you really have to explore all your options. And how does it work? Well, let's say these are your conventional options in yellow, okay? Let's say your surgical option here in green, okay? Let's say your molecular-based options based on the genetic profile of the cancer are here in blue. Let's say the trials available to you are here in green. And let's say everything else includes all these local regional therapies. So what you do is you say, okay, What's the best way to sequence these? What's the ideal approach? And why does that matter? You know, a lot of oncologists are like, Bastin, why do you do this? Like, I don't have to know this. I can just decide on what I want to do when the time comes. No, that's wrong. And I'll tell you why. Number one, if you want to do a clinical trial in this third line setting, let's say that you have your mindset on that, okay? But you give someone a drug up front here that precludes them, makes them ineligible for the trial, you have a problem. Now, your third line treatment, you can't give. The other reason it's important, and this actually I think is more important why, let's say you know that your next option, let's say you're here and you know your next option is terrible. You know it's not really that good. You know it's not gonna do a lot. Well, you better figure out a different approach. You better be saying to yourself, okay, I need a trial here. And if you need a trial here, you better get ready. You can't just decide on a trial in the moment. That doesn't happen. You have to get ready. Or let's say you're a big center. Let's say you're a big institution, okay? and you treat GBM, lots of people come to you for GBM, they think you're great at GBM. Well, if you don't have good clinical trials, what are you doing? Like, you're not good at GBM then, period. You're just not. If you look at your treatment approach and your clinical trial in second line, or you don't even have one, or third line, you're not a good center. You, you might as well just go to anyone else. Like, there's no point in going there, right? The whole reason to go to a big institution, there's a couple reasons, we'll come, we'll come to them later. But it's based on kind of the team approach. The surgeons matter, the radiation person matters but it's based on the trials. So if your oncologist, right, who really does this part of it, if your oncologist doesn't have trials available to them, they better find them, if particularly at a big institution, you better have good trials or you're doing your patients a disservice and you really shouldn't call yourself a big institution. That's the whole point of going there, okay? So I think it's really, really important to go through this. Now, why is it so important? Well, it's so important because this is a notoriously aggressive cancer where people live on average for about 15 months to 18 months. Now, I hate talking about numbers, You've heard me say it many times if you watch anything in this series. I hate, hate talking about numbers, hate it. The reason I hate it is because every patient's different. I'm not God and I really don't think like that. I'm trying to keep you alive for a very long time with a good quality of life. That's what I'm trying to do, right? So I'm not thinking about you dying, okay? That's not remotely in my mind. So the idea is because this number is not awesome, it's roughly a year and a half, you say to yourself, I need to do better. Like I need trials to do better. I need molecular options to do better. I need to do better. So I need to think about this rubric. I need to say to myself, how do I do better? And I need to plan for it in advance. So it matters, okay? And the bottom line is you don't have an expiration date. Despite the fact that 10% of people are alive in five years who have this diagnosis, you don't have an expiration date. And I actually hate this number. I think it's garbage. I don't even think about it, okay? I really don't think about it. Number one, I think that number will get way better in the future as we get better at this. Number two, I'm trying to get you into a situation where you live for an extensive period of time with a good quality of life. I don't think about these numbers, but I only put them here because you have to understand the gravity of the situation because it helps tell you, I need to go look at trials. I need to think about molecular-based options. 
I need to play chess against my cancer. I can't play checkers because these numbers are not great. I need to think about the future because really you're trying to control your destiny here as much as you can. You're trying to advocate for yourself as much as you can. You're going to hear things today people do not tell you. Okay. So you can advocate. That's the whole idea. And I want you always, always, always think in common. Just take this with you. Just say, okay, I'm going to take this acronym with me. Simple. I'm going to run through the doctors. Say, hey, can you just go through this with me? What are the options here? What's the plan? Right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the molecular part of this, the molecular based options part, because that's the part I think most people are unfamiliar with. Right. And I think that's the part I do best. You know, I think that we do this great. I have an international molecular tumor board that we just got done doing at 11 o'clock today. We do it every two weeks, but this is something I think we do best. So here's the idea. Okay. We can do something called nectarine sequencing on your cancer, just NGS. And that's all I want you to know here. Just write NGS. Don't write anything else. Don't even listen to me if you don't want. Okay. Just wait till we get the rest of the stuff if that's what you want to hear. But just write down NGS. What NGS essentially does is it looks at the mutations in the brain cancer itself. Okay. And the idea is let's say you have a mutation in a purple gene. Well, we might have a purple drug that targets that specific mutation. So we'd want to use it. If you have a mutation in a green gene, we might have a green drug and an orange gene, orange drug. So the idea here is we're trying to find mutations in your cancer that we can take advantage of with treatments we have that target those mutations or the proteins that come from those mutations. Now, I want you to understand this is becoming bigger in GBM. I'm actually happy to see my neuro-oncology colleagues who just do this for a living starting to really adopt this in their practice. It took a while, but I'm starting to see it now pretty frequently. I've been doing this in GBM since 2015, right? So seven years I've been ordering these tests on my GM, GBM patients, but that was because I did everything else at the same time. I knew this was important. I was looking for these mutations. So they're starting to really adopt this and why? Because roughly 2% of patients with GBM will have a mutation in BRAF and this specific mutation where we can use drugs that target it. Now I've been using these drugs literally since 2011 in melanoma. And, and actually before that, the first time I used it was 2009 on a clinical trial but they're starting to use these drugs now, which is nice. Listen, I'm proud of them. That's great. But the bottom line is you need to go looking for this mutation because you might be able to get this drug. And that's really nice. I'll show you a picture of that. Okay. There are also occasional people who have NTRK fusions. We have great drugs for those, but the bottom line is we have drugs that can target certain mutations in the GBM, but we got to go looking for those mutations. How do you know? You don't look right. I want to be clear about something though. And this is what you're going to hear from the GBM experts. They're going to say, well, Bastin, why am I doing this? Like, it's rarely positive. Like, what the hell? Less than 1% of people are really going to have something or less than say 2%. It's really not oftentimes going to give you some revolutionary answer. But what if it does, right? If this was your mom, dad, brother, sister, child, it's the only way I think, by the way, it's a doctor, it's how I think. If it any of those people you love, you'd be doing this test. It's a reflex. Because if you find something, it's like winning the lottery, so to speak. Of course, nothing's great about the situation we're in here, but it can be transformative. And that's what you're doing. You're trying to play chess, trying to think many steps ahead, trying to say, hey, is there something else here that I can use? And so I essentially want you to ask your physicians about NGS. That's all I want you to do. Now, look at this patient. Again, pictures are not hard. I'm going to walk you through them, but I want you to appreciate something. So look at this patient who has a glioblastoma multiforma that has a mutation in BRAF B600E. So this is the type of mutation in the gene BRAF, okay? They put them on this treatment, dibrafen and trametinib, which targets this mutation. You can only use it because they have this mutation. And you can see in one month, right? That cancer is essentially gone, right? In one month, these are pills, pretty easy to handle. I mean, there's some side effects, but pretty well tolerated, right? One month, it's essentially much, much better. And in three months, you can't see it. That's why it matters, guys. It's so important. It can completely transform someone's course, right? Now we've been using these drugs for a very long time in other diseases, melanoma, hairy cell leukemia, non-small cell lung cancer. And in fact, this is such a well-known phenomenon now that the FDA recently said, okay, it doesn't matter what kind of cancer you have. If you have this mutation in any type of cancer, you can use these drugs. It's nice. They basically said, look, everybody with this mutation, no matter the cancer can now use these drugs, insurance will cover it. And so now if you have this mutation in GBM, these drugs are available to, available to you, insurance will cover it. Okay, so that's really, really nice. They're actually ongoing clinical trials. About a year ago, I saw a paper looking at using these drugs in patients with 
glioblastoma multiforma with this mutation and it said it works well i was like yeah okay of course we know that that's good i'm glad you're proving it but we kind of already know it's going to probably work and i'm using these drugs anyways no matter if you have the paper or not so i'm happy for them but they were definitely behind the times we were doing this a long time ago okay now if you look at this patient here's another nice example okay this patient also had this mutation right they got these drugs so you can see eight months later cancer is much better and this is 14 months later you don't really see the cancer this is a year and two months later, guys, on this drug. So these two drugs, because of this mutation, it matters a lot. So please do it. Now understand it's rare that you would have this particular mutation, but you can see why it matters. Let's talk about immune therapy for a moment. Lots of people at GBM are going to get immune therapy. Whether it's indicated or not, you're going to see immune therapy. And the reason for it is because we're desperate in this disease. We only have a certain number of options. I think it's funny to me. I'll tell you this, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but I'm just going to talk about this for a moment. You know, you'll have these people who call themselves GBM experts, and they probably, they're really good. Like, they do GBM for a living. They're good, okay? And they'll say, okay, I know things other people don't. Well, that's not entirely true to a large extent. And why do I say that? Because there's only, so, like, so many drugs in GBM that are available. You've got temozolomide. You've got Avastin, Carmustine, Lamustine, Topatikan, Rintikan, PCV variants, and that's it. That's pretty much all you have, right? There's like 10 things to know in terms of drugs and GBM. So how much do you really have to know, right? But the bottom line is we end up being basically beggars in this disease. So beggars can't be choosers, right? So we use immune therapy almost whether or not there's an indication for it. So what is immune therapy, okay? Immune therapy is where we take an immune system cell, right? and we're trying to rev it up, we're trying to stimulate it to attack the cancer. So we give the patient a drug to essentially stimulate the immune system cell to recognize the cancer cell is foreign and to eradicate it, to kill it. That's what we're trying to do, okay? Now, when it comes to patients, there are three things we look at to gauge how well patients will respond to immune therapy. How well is this patient gonna respond when I give them a drug designed to rev up their immune system? And the three things we look at is we look at the degree in which the cancer cells make a protein called PDL1. So what cancer cells will do is they'll make this protein called PDL1, put it on the surface of the cancer cell, and that will essentially shut off the immune system cell. Please go to the first talk I gave, the one I just alluded to earlier today. It'll talk extensively about that. I don't want to spend too much time on this today. But the bottom line is the higher the number of cells that make this protein, the cancer cells that make this PDL1 protein, the more likely you respond to immune therapy. Okay. In addition, if your cancer cell has a lot of DNA instability, we call it microcellular instability, so it's a portion of the DNA that's unstable, but really it's a measure of DNA instability. Okay, don't worry, again, don't get lost in the details. I don't care about any of this. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a background, okay? If your cancer makes a lot, or has a lot of DNA instability, so it's MSI high, it's more likely to respond to immune therapy. Similarly, if there's a lot of mutations in the cancer, we call that tumor mutation burden, so the amount of mutations in the cancer, if there's a high level of mutations, it's also more likely to respond, respond to immune therapy. So all I want you to take from this is to know, okay, if my cancer is one positive, if it's MSI high, if it's TMB high, I have to ask about immune therapy. I have to know if a patient can get immune therapy, okay? And so you're going to ask your physician about pd one MSI, and TMB, okay? That's all I want you to take from this. So molecular profiling is very important. You have to be your own hero sometimes. Don't worry about the details. Just ask about the profiling. Just ask what I put in red. NGS, pd one TMB, MSI, and HRD. This gets a little complicated. Please go to the first talk I gave, but just write these things down. Like they're literally just three letters each or four letters each or three to four letters each and just write it down and take it to your physician. Okay, let's talk about clinical trials for a minute. So I had a very nice person ask me online about clinical trials, okay? And, and sorry, about, about what institution to choose, okay? So they asked me, you know, Bassem, I'm going here, but should I go somewhere else? And I said to them, I said, look, the way to decide where to go for glioblastoma multiforma, the way to make that decision, it's not necessarily based on the cancer doctor. It's not based on someone like me or someone you know, better than me. It's based on if the institution has good clinical trials and it's based on how good the neurosurgeon is and it's based on good, how good the radiation doctor is. It's not entirely dependent on your oncologist, I promise you. However, with that said, it's based on your oncologist to the extent to which they have the clinical trials. Oftentimes the best GBM doctors will have the, some of the greatest clinical trials. That's why it typically goes hand in hand and that's why it matters, okay? 
But the bottom line is, I really, really want you to think about clinical trials the minute you hear about GBM. I already told you why, okay? We're building that COMET acronym. We're playing chess against cancer, but because the numbers are not at where we want them, you gotta think about clinical trials from minute one. So what are clinical trials? Well, they're experiments designed to save lives. We know that, okay? They're not meant to hurt people. They oftentimes provide hope where there was none. They're an essential component of a treatment map. And I want you to constantly ask your oncologist about this. Now, I actually showed people how to do this in that first talk. If you just go to clinicaltrials.gov and I actually literally walk people through how to look for clinical trials for themselves. So please do do that. But the bottom line is I want you thinking about clinical trials. So here's a patient who is on a clinical trial that's actually with immune therapy, okay? And you can see here's the cancer initially, right? And now you see it month 12, still not there. And this is on clinical trial. So I want you, please, please, please to think about it. This is actually a CAR-T clinical trial. You can see it here. So this is a CAR-T clinical trial. This is the chimeric interceptor T-cell therapy. I won't go through this now, but this was a very interesting clinical trial. All right, so now it's time to walk you through your journey. We've set you up for it. You know what to expect. Time to now walk through the details. This is what you've been waiting for, I promise you, okay? So we are going to try and build your specific treatment map, something I call treatment cartography. It's in that playing chess article if you wanna go see it. So we think about conventional options. So these include chemotherapy predominantly. Immune therapy might also be there, okay? Surgery, the O part of this is unbelievably important, okay? That initial surgery, if they can do it, if it's in a reasonable location, is incredibly important. And what you want is you want to take out as much of that tumor as possible. You want what's called a maximal debulking, okay? Now, here's the problem with GBM, and here's what sucks about GBM. What sucks about GBM is that this cancer grows like fingers into the brain, okay? And because of that finger-like growth, it's really hard to get all of it when you do surgery, okay? Because you can't even see those fingers. And that's why it keeps coming back and coming back and coming back because you can't get all of this typically, right? Because of the way it grows. It grows like fingers. That's why glioblastoma multiforma is such a nightmare when it comes to treating it, okay? So surgery though is so important. That initial surgery would take out as much of the, as they can with the, from the tumor without hurting you, without taking away too much of your neurologic function is so important. I want you to ask about molecular profile. Very simple, NGS, pd one TMB, MSI, HRD, that's it, just ask. Radiation is gonna be so important. We'll talk about that in a moment. Other local regional options can be used. I'm gonna show those to you today. So you'll be equipped to say, hey, can we use laser therapy? Most oncologists are not thinking about that, I promise you. But we're going to try and make it so you're equipped to ask the right questions, okay? To push the envelope. So you're gonna see that in a moment. And clinical trials are essential. So this is what the overall map looks like. I'm gonna go through this very simply with you. I promise this will look complicated, but you can just take this one slide. This one slide tells you everything you need to know. I made this slide so you could do that. So pushing back, shot one, bullet one in the gun. Bullet one in the gun is gonna involve surgery, chemotherapy and radiation. What we do is we do a maximal resection, take out as much of that cancer as possible. That's why the neurosurgeon matters, okay? You can take out as much as you can. Now there are gonna be some cancers you cannot take out because of the location. That's all right. We do what we need to do. Surgery would not be an option there. You would go straight to the next part of it. But the bottom line is you're gonna do surgery first. You can see it right here. I put it in that algorithm for you. It's very simple. Maximal surgical debulking. After that, you're gonna use Temidar chemotherapy, temozolomide, the drug I talked about earlier. And you're gonna give it with radiation at the same time. We typically do six weeks of radiation, Monday through Friday, okay? And we give Temidar every day during those six weeks, which is 42 days. So you get it daily for 42 days. While you get radiation, they synergize. They help each other kill the cancer, okay? After you're done with that first six weeks of radiation plus temozolomide, then we do six months roughly of temidar. So we've given you the chemo with radiation. Now we give you the chemo behind it for six months. There's a lot of data showing that going more than six months does not help as long as the cancer is not progressed, okay? Take that with a grain of salt. Every doctor might be different. There's a lot of data showing you really just do six months, okay? And then we talk about the Optune device. So I'm going to talk about it in a moment, but some people will also have patients wear the Optune device while they do these six months of Temidar, okay? We're going to talk about it in a moment, but you can see here, we do Temidar, so we do the surgery, then we do the Temidar chemotherapy with radiation, then we do the Temidar plus minus the Optune device, and clinical trials are really important. If there's a clinical trial, okay, I'm going to talk about this more later, but if there's a clinical trial, where you get Temidar and radiation plus minus a drug that they're experimenting with. So you get the standard of care and then they add a drug to it. 
those are good clinical trials, right? Because you're getting the standard of care and now you also get another shot at the cancer with a drug that's being experimented with. In general, that's not gonna hurt you. So I like those trials. Why do I like those trials? Because we're doing what we're gonna do anyways. Might as well take another shot, show this cancer some other method of attack. So I like those trials. So when you go looking at trials and you see Temidar plus radiation plus minus the drug, I like those trials. Think about those trials. They're pretty intuitively reasonable trials to do. So this is pushing back shot one. I'm gonna go over it in detail. Don't get lost in details. You can come back to this slide. Again, big picture, forest. I'm giving you the trees too, but I want you to think about the forest and come back to the trees. You know, and look at this later, okay? So we're gonna talk about this part right here. So you've had surgery. Now we're gonna give you Temidar chemotherapy and radiation, okay? At the same time. So side effects of Temidar. So we talked about how it's given orally once a day for 42 days. Side effects, nausea and vomiting, we can protect you from that. We're really good at protecting you from that. Fatigue is a big one. Infection is a big one, but people do just fine. I see diarrhea constipation. In general, it's a pretty safe drug, right? I think it, people do really, really well with this drug in general. There's different, you know, obviously different effects on different patients. It's certainly idiosyncratic, but people do pretty well. But here's a very important consideration I see people forget about. Even some experts, I've seen like patients that have come to me in second opinion from other places, they're not on these drugs. So here's the deal. There is a type of bacteria called pneumocystis carini that can cause a type of pneumonia in patients getting Temidar. And that pneumonia is called PCP pneumonia, pneumocystis carina pneumonia, okay? Because Temidar essentially suppresses T cell lymphocytes, so part of, part of your immune system, okay? Which makes you susceptible for that particular infection, so PCP pneumonia. So we oftentimes will put people on Bactrim when we have them on Temidar. So ask your physician about this. We typically put them on Bactrim to prevent that pneumonia while we give the patients Temidar. In addition, I oftentimes use acyclovir to prevent shingles, right? When I give patients the Temidar drug. So you can ask about this, that's an important consideration. Let's talk about radiation though. So the radiation is given Monday through Friday for six weeks. Side effects there, and I'm not a radiation oncologist, so you need to talk to them a little bit more about details, but I'll show you the ones I typically see when I see my patients. So nausea, vomiting, headaches, cognitive effects. This is a big one. So we oftentimes see some memory loss, brain fog, people, you know, they get really frustrated and rightfully so because your mind isn't the same while you're getting radiation. Sometimes it depends on the location of the cancer, depends on how big it is. But the bottom line is some people get some cognitive loss. You can have some hair loss with this. You can get what's called radiation necrosis. That's very unlikely, okay? That's very unlikely. But sometimes areas around the brain that you've radiated will die. That gets a little challenging. Don't worry about that. The bottom line is, in my opinion, it's pretty safe. People do pretty well with radiation. Again, ask your radiation oncologist about this for details. But in general, I think people do pretty well. So when we give patients chemotherapy and when we do radiation, and this is actually in the very first talk I gave, I want you to please go watch it. I give people 10 survival tips. But I always tell people the inches in that, right? You got to really think about the details and you really got to let your, know your doctor, doctor know if you have symptoms, because the sooner we can intervene on those, the better you'll do. Every little inch matters. So you have to understand what the inches are. So when you're getting these treatments, you have to know that fevers are serious. If you get a fever, which can be indicative of infection, you've got to let your doctor know right away, probably got to go to the ER. Because the idea here is sometimes that Temidar chemotherapy will suppress the immune system sufficiently where any infection can be a problem, right? And if your immune system is sufficiently suppressed and you have a fever, which is indicative of an infection, instead of just declining gradually, you can fall off a cliff. And that's what I get worried about. I worry about people falling off a cliff. So if you tell me about the fever right away, it's unlikely you'll ever fall off the cliff, we can address it. But you just gotta make sure that you understand the fevers are inches that you gotta let us know about. Pain, if you get new pain, like a new headache, new vision issues, like new pain, you gotta let us know. New, like any sort of bleeding, you gotta let us know. Shortness of breath, you gotta let us know. Profound diarrhea, you gotta let us know. So these are things you need to know about. Bleeding's not so important unless you're on a blood thinner, but these other ones you gotta let us know about. Hypervigilance, you gotta be hypervigilant. You gotta know about every single inch. And you can really never call me too much. You can never bother me. You can never tell me too much, but you can tell me too little. You can call me too little. So please, please, please talk to your oncologist about any symptom you have, your care team, whether it's the nurse practitioner or the PA or whoever's taking care of you, please let them know. So the other thing I wanna talk about. So we just talked about this part of shot number one. Now we're gonna talk about what happens after. And I consider all of this shot number one, right? So after you've had surgery, after you've done the chemotherapy with the radiation, then we do the same chemotherapy for six months longer, and you can get the Optune device if you want. Now, there is a mixed perspective on this. I would say about a 50-50 sort of perspective. 
where some big institutions, some experts think it's useful, some experts don't, okay, the opt-in device that is. But the idea here is with the Temidar part, this yellow part, we give you Temidar, we give it for five days, the dose is a little higher than what you got before, but for five days, every 20, 28 days. So you get it for five days, you get 23 days off. And we do that six times, so roughly six months, okay? Same side effects we talked about, right? Same considerations we talked about. Now the Optune device depicted here is something I wanna discuss. I actually find that some brain cancer doctors don't even talk about it because they don't believe in it, which is fine. I'm, you know, they're experts. I'm not saying they're wrong. We just talked about how it's 50-50, but I do want to at least mention, I think it's important. So the Optune device, the way it works, right, is it basically puts these alternating electrical currents through your cancer. You can see them here, right? So let's say this is the cancer, and basically it's got these alternating electrical currents that are designed essentially to try and kill the cancer. You can see that here, okay? The device itself looks like this. You have these pads that you wear on your scalp. You have to shave your head for this. So that's the one major, major thing for patients here. But you wear, you have a shaved head. You wear this battery pack, it actually looks much nicer than this now, but you wear this battery pack. And this is what the Optune device does and essentially basically tries to kill the cancer through these alternating electrical currents. Okay, you have to wear this device 18 hours a day, which is a huge nuisance. You have to shave your head, which is also a huge nuisance. But the nice thing is it's incredibly safe. You can get some local irritation from the device, in which case we just you know, address that. But in general, it's incredibly safe. I have used this on patients. And the key here though, is that some patients don't wanna use it, some patients do, because it's uncomfortable, it's not fun to do, and I totally get that. So at least you've heard about it, right? So you, heard, you know about it, your oncologist may not even wanna use it, if your oncologist wants to use it, at least you know about what it would entail, and now you at least understand it. You can actually ask about it. Okay, good. So when we do treatment, we are always, always, always assessing response. How did we do, right? Like that's crucial. Otherwise, what the heck are you doing? So response assessment for GBM is not rocket science in the sense that you're just doing an MRI before and after, right? So you do treatment, then you do an MRI, after treatment, then you do periodic MRIs to make sure you're still in good shape. Okay. It's not rocket science, but it can get complicated, right? Now, the idea is simple. If it's not broken, if there's no progression, you're not gonna fix it, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if there's no progression, you're usually not gonna change what you're doing, okay? If there's progression, though, something is worse. You don't wanna be insane. You wanna do the same thing over and over and expect a different result, right? So you're gonna change the treatment if you see progression. But this is where it gets challenging. Trying to determine if someone has responded or if someone's progressed is really, really hard. Let's look at this patient. In fact, I'm gonna skip this part, but let's go to, so actually, let me go back for a moment. So it can be very hard to determine if somebody's actually responding or not. This gets really challenging. There's an art in interpreting scans. And that, to be honest, I'll be honest with you, that is where I think experts are really, really, really good. They're good at, at interpreting scans in a way that other people can't. This is where I think they are incredibly useful, okay? Among other, there's multiple reasons they're useful, but this is where they're really, really helpful. So here's the idea though. You do a brain MRI roughly two to eight weeks after the radiation part, okay? Then you do it every two to four months for three years, then every three to six months indefinitely. It's come straight out of our guidelines, okay? Now I wanna show you this. This is really important. This shows you how complicated it can be to interpret these scans. Now, we do MRIs with contrast. That's what we do. We give you something called gadolinium and we look at what the MRI looks like. Okay, that's all we do, right? The problem is this contrast can be influenced by radiation, abastin, not just the cancer. It's not just the cancer that can impact what that, the MRI looks like. All these other things can influence what the MRI looks like. So when you're trying to decide, hey, how are we doing with the cancer? You can get misled because all these other things can influence what the MRI looks like. Let me show you this picture. You gotta see this picture, okay? This patient right here with this glioblastoma multiforma, two different pictures, same patient, okay? They get radiation, they have surgery, sorry, here's after surgery. Here's one month after radiation. And it looks worse, like look, here's the cancer. You look at all of this stuff happening around it, right? It looks worse, but those are actually just radiation changes. So they don't do anything different. They find out that it's actually not cancer, they actually biopsy because they were so nervous. And look at what, at 12 months, look at how much better it is. So this is what we call pseudo progression. It looked worse on the scan, but it wasn't actually worse. So pseudo progression is the bane of a cancer doctor's existence. This is the part that's really challenging. If you do an MRI too soon after radiation, you can get misled. 
It can look worse, but it's not actually worse. It's what we call pseudo progression. It's that the radiation itself made it look worse, but the cancer is actually better. So I always tell people trends, not snapshots. In this very moment, one month after surgery, things looked awful. But if you just took a step back, trended it, you'd say, okay, let's do it at three months. Things look better. Six months, things look better. So the trend tells you that this isn't cancer. The snapshot freaks you out, but the trend gives you the answer. So I always tell people trends, not snapshots. Okay, the other thing you're gonna see as a GBM patient is in numerous big facilities, like really great facilities, they're using other imaging modalities to try and say, is this real or not? Like, is this actually cancer or not? And so what they're doing there is they're doing things like functional MRIs, functional PET CTs. Let me show you what I mean there. This is a functional MRI, okay? So you can see this patient here. Here's the glioblastoma multiforma, okay? It looks like it's getting worse, right? They're getting radiation. It looked like it was worse. But if you look at the functional MRI, look at the red part here. This red part was the cancer, active cancer. Okay, you can see that there. But the red is gone. It shows you that, yes, this looks worse, but that's not actually active cancer. The cancer is dead. It's not red anymore. So this functional MRI can really help you, this enhanced MRI. You can see on this picture, okay, on this picture, when you look at this, you can see that here's the cancer itself. Okay, it's over here, right? You can see this right here, sorry. So this is where the spot is. It looks like it's getting worse. You can see it looks a little bit worse. And then when you do the MRI, you can see, yeah, it looks a little red there. That looks a little bit worse and that might be worse. But the bottom line is there are other treatment modalities you might get told about. They might put you through to try and figure out, is it cancer getting worse or not? So this is an advantage of being at bigger institutions. They do these things. And it's a bigger research. A lot of people working on this. So once you've done kind of the MRI after to see if things are going well, you're gonna have this response assessment. This is highly nuanced. It's really difficult. Sometimes it can be hard to interpret. MRI scans are performed on a scheduled basis. You can see that here. Always comparing to previous scans. It's not complicated in that regard. It's before and after. How's it look before and after, before and after, before and after, right? So once you get treatment, the after. Then we wait a little while, after. We wait a little while, after, right? Before and after, We're always comparing. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't be insane. So don't do the same thing over and over, expect a different result. And ask to see your scans. I want you to look at pictures. All right, let's say things have actually progressed. Let's say you got your first treatment, now things are worse. So let's talk about the second bullet in the gun, okay? So again, I want you thinking comment. Immediately ask your physician about these five things. You go right back to this comment algorithm. So second line approach. Many people from a conventional perspective will use Avastin. They'll use this drug. We'll talk about it in a minute. Please ask if additional surgery is useful. We didn't used to do a lot of surgery after this first line. But now I'm seeing people go through a lot of surgery. A lot of experts are saying, hey, let's do surgery. And there's a lot of trials looking at this. But sometimes people do surgery again and again. And I've seen patients have five surgeries. So I'm not saying it's right or wrong, okay? All I'm saying is you need to ask your neurosurgeon, ask your oncologist, ask your radiation doctor if surgery is an option here, okay? Make sure we did the molecular test, make sure those were done. And then ask about additional local regional therapies, everything else part. So ask if additional radiation would help you. Ask about something called LIT. I'm gonna show you in a moment. It's basically laser-based therapy. You're gonna ask about this, okay? And then you're gonna ask about trials. You're always asking about trials. It's always important. So let's talk about the conventional part, the Avastin. So many people like to use Avastin here, okay? And so you can see it here, it's in second line. So a lot of people like to use Avastin, okay? But some people use other chemotherapies. There are many options here, you can see them here. Okay. Some people you do a clinical trial. Some people do a molecular-based option. You can see them here. They're all here. Don't worry about it. Okay. Many of you will get a drug called Avastin. So let's talk about that for a moment. Avastin is a drug that's given every two weeks IV. The way Avastin works, right, is when cancer cells grow, they need oxygen. And the way to do that is they make blood vessels that can feed them with more oxygen, a process called angiogenesis. Avastin targets that process, right? That's what it does. Okay. Now, because it targets blood vessel formation, the side effects are related to blood vessel issues. So 1% of people can have a stroke, 1% bleeding. So those are things just to be aware of, okay? But it's generally safe. One very special consideration with Avastin, which people are gonna get, it's otherwise known as Bevacizumab, by the way. So Bevacizumab is Avastin. One major consideration is the kidneys. So with Avastin, you can actually spill too much protein because the kidneys get damaged. 
So that's why when you get a Vastin, they're going to ask you to do your urine test every time you get a Vastin. They're looking at the urine to see if you're spilling more protein. If you spill too much protein, they're going to say, wait a second, the Vastin might be doing this. We might have to hold the Vastin. So please understand, a Vastin is generally very safe, but you're going to have to monitor the kidneys while you're getting the drug. Okay, with that said, Avastin is a decent drug. We all use it, but there's a lot of controversy as to how good it really is. Some people think it's not that great. It affects the MRI appearance in different ways. I don't go through all of this, okay? Like it doesn't impact overall survival. I don't wanna go through that either, okay? The bottom line is I want you thinking clinical trials, big time. I definitely want you thinking about clinical trials here. Shot one, don't go on a clinical trial, okay? We live with it. Shot two, I want you asking about clinical trials because we need to do better, right? We're always trying to do better. Shot two onward, you gotta really think about clinical trials. Can't be debating it, just gotta ask about it. It's really important. Let's talk about everything else for a minute, that E part. So we talked about how we radiate the area. Okay, we typically do localized radiation, something called SBRT, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. They do um, external, th external beam therapy. So I should say that they do this for 30 days, 30 day, sorry. They do it for six weeks and they do external beam therapy. They're not doing SBRT classically for us. But when it comes back, they can start thinking about doing localized radiation that could happen. So please just ask about it. I'm not an expert there. Ask the radiation doctor. Say, hey, is there a role for radiation? Okay. Ask about clinical trials in this regard. So there are some clinical trials now, guys, where they're directly injected the cancer, right, with various chemicals or various substances, okay, trying to kill it. They're also doing ultrasound where they'll kind of say, okay, let's try and kill this with ultrasound, right? I want you asking about clinical trials to try and kill this thing locally. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is what we call laser interstitial thermal therapy. So if the cancer is small enough in the right location, they can insert a probe and do laser therapy on it to try and kill it. I want you to ask about that too. Literally just take this slide with me, right? The whole purpose of this wasn't to like make sure you became a GBM expert, right? The whole purpose of it was to give you the material you need in a consolidated way with a good flow to tell you, hey, Okay, I'm gonna take this with me and go to my doctor and ask these questions. Good, so here's lit therapy again. You just insert the probe into the tumor and try and kill it. So look at this patient. Here's a cancer here. They do the laser therapy and boom, looks awesome, right? So just ask about it. It's very simple, very safe. Some people are really good at this. There are some really good centers doing this. So please just ask about it. All right, pushing back shot number three. So let's say now you progressed through the first two lines. A lot of people are gonna use immune therapy here. I just wanna be very clear on that, okay? A lot of people are gonna use immune therapy like we talked about, irrespective of the measures I talked about, right? So we have some really good ways of trying to target this cancer or try, sorry, trying to figure out if patients will respond to immune therapy. But even when all of those things show you nothing, some people still use immune therapy because we're desperate. We're beggars in this disease, we're not choosers. So they say, hey, you know what? I know immune therapy is safe, let's try it. Now I've been using immune therapy for over a decade right? The neuro-oncologists, the GBM experts, the people who just do GBM, I do everything. But the people who just do GBM, they've been doing immune therapy for the last couple of years, right? So we know immune therapy incredibly well. We use it all the time. I have no problem with them getting immune therapy, even if all those markers are normal, because we got nothing else, right? So I have zero issue with that. But what I really want you thinking about, right? And this is where I really want you thinking about trials. That's what I want you thinking about. But here's the deal. Every time the disease gets worse, you go from first line to second line. You go from second line to third line. Every single time, just take this with you, this COMET acronym, and you ask, okay, tell me what the conventional therapy is available. Is additional surgery available? Talk to the neurosurgeon. Hey, is there a role for more surgery here? Can I have this resected again? Sometimes they're the only ones that know the answer to that, right? Ask them, okay? Ask about the molecular test. Ask about the additional options. Can we do laser therapy here? Can we do a trial where they just do ultrasound? Can we do a trial where they inject it? Ask them about the trials. That's what I want you doing. Not complicated, it's what I want you doing. So I will say though, a lot of people in third line, if there's no trial, nothing that, nothing else, they will typically use chemotherapy, okay? And the chemotherapy options are here, topotecan, arenetecan, et cetera. A lot of people use lomustine. A lot of people use this. Some people use something like regorafenib, something like that. Some people actually use these in the second bullet, not the third bullet. Just be aware, lots of different ways to do this. No right or wrong answer, that's critical. But honest to God, it's all about clinical trials here. So again, you do the response assessment. You're always checking to see how things are going, things we talked about. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You keep going back to the well. If it's broke, you got to change things. And this is kind of what we typically do. Now I want to talk about clinical trials. And this is, I think, the last slide or one of the last slides. So 
I went through all 330 ongoing GBM trials for you this week. I looked at everything that's up to, up to date current for you, okay? I have to be a little careful. I have a company that does a lot of clinical trial efficacy assessment. That's what we do. So I look at hundreds of clinical trials a day. I look at hundreds of proteins a day because I, I treat everything. I actually see patients on a full-time basis. I run two national clinical trials for a company called Biotech. I consult for multiple companies. I run, and so I, I do a lot of things. I have two companies. I have a, you know, an institute we're building, lots of stuff. Okay, the bottom line is I'm always looking at the big picture. I can see trials in a way that people can't. I can see what the drugs are. I know what they do in this disease, this disease, I've used them before, but it doesn't matter, okay. I have to be careful when I talk about this though, because number one, I'm not God. I don't know what trial is gonna work and what's not. I can think about it in a particular way. I can say, okay, I think that's probably not gonna work or that's probably, you know, that has a chance, but no one ever knows. You don't really know till you play the game, right? It's like any given Sunday, Football, you never know who's going to win it to actually play the game. So I will be careful here. I don't want to insult anyone. So I'm just going to talk about the trials that are available in a broad way. But if you have a trial in particular you're interested in, you can always write me and I can talk to you about it. Now, here's the deal. I love, love, love trials that have the standard of care, what you would get anyways, and they add an experimental drug. I love those trials, right? Because you're going to get what we're going to give you anyways. Might as well give you something else to try and attack a cancer in a different way. I love those trials, right? So I like the trials that involve Temidar plus radiation you're going to get anyways, and then they have plus minus drug X. So half of you get drug X, half of you don't because they're trying to figure out if it works or not. But the nice thing is you're still getting what you would get anyways. So I love those trials. I also like the trials where there's, you're going to get a vast in anyways in the second line. So after you've gone to the second bullet, if you're going to get a vast in anyways, might as well throw another drug there to see if it helps you. In general, it's rare for a clinical trial to hurt a patient. Okay, it's exceedingly rare for that to happen. It can, don't get me wrong, it can, but that's rare. But I like the trials that are standard of care plus minus drug X, okay? I like those trials. So even the immunotherapy trials that are like later on, after you've kind of gone through the first two bullets, if they wanna do immunotherapy plus minus drug X, I'm fine with that, that's fine. There are several cellular therapy trials now, a lot. What does that mean? Well, they're trying to engineer your immune system cells. So they take them out of your body, okay? They genetically modify them and they put you put them back in your body to try and attack your cancer cells. There's lots of those trials going on. That patient I showed you earlier was in a clinical trial who had that amazing response. That was using a CAR T therapy. I like these trials. I like the idea behind them. I'm a, I like them. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. I like these trials because they're outside the box. I like these trials in terms of trying to kill your cancer in a way that's been really unavailable for a long time. Now, I should tell you, and I need to be honest here, when we do clinical trials, the vast majority of them do not work. The vast, vast majority of them don't work, right? But you do the best you can with the information you have and you try, right? So I like these clinical trials, whether you want to use dendritic cells or whatever you want to do here, that's fine. Local regional therapies, the ones where I talked about the ultrasound, they're trying to do like an ablation where they try and heat it up, heat up the tumor, try and kill it. I have no problem with those trials as long as they're done in the right way at the right time. There are some trials looking at novel mechanisms, like entirely new mechanisms where patients have never seen this class of drug. I like those. I like those later on, not up front, but I like those. I like the idea of showing cancer somebody hasn't seen before. I love that. In fact, that's really my dogma, right? That's my motto. I'm going to show cancer something that hasn't seen. I'm always thinking like that. What has the cancer seen? How has it been attacked? I got to do something different, okay? There's a lot of pathogen-based therapy. So I know people know about this, right? Polio vaccine, things like that. But the big one, the big one came out of Japan where it's actually already approved looking at the herpes simplex virus, right? HSV-1, the one that causes cold sores. So they're using this virus. It's actually already approved in Japan, but they have confirmatory studies they need to do. So look good early, but they need to do some confirmatory studies. But I like these trials. They're fine. They're a black box. I have no idea if they're going to work or not, right? It's impossible to really know, but they're decent trials. A lot of trials targeting EGFR, a lot of PARP inhibitor trials. I'm going to just not talk too much about those, but just know that those are out there. A lot of immune therapy trials, Lots of drugs being used that are approved in other diseases. So sastatism, that was a drug I use in breast cancer. I actually just treated a patient with breast cancer with this drug. It's the first time they're using it in GBM and trial. It's not bad. Lots of trials trying to disrupt the blood-brain barrier. What do I mean by that? Okay. Well, we have a blood-brain barrier that prevents a lot of drugs from getting from the body in the blood to the brain. So a lot of companies are saying, look, if we can mess up that blood-brain barrier, we can use these drugs to get into the brain, right? So a lot of people are doing that. But the bottom line is, look, you do the best you can with what you have. Okay, and I'm proud of everyone thinking about trials. I'm proud of my colleagues for having these trials. I think there's a lot of GBM experts. Please know that they are GBM experts because they have the trial and they've got a lot of experience. I think they're amazing people, very talented. I respect them and I commend them. But trials need to be part of your journey. That's all I wanna say there. 
So this is the overall journey. You can go back to it whenever you want. Concluding remarks, last slide. Do not be shy, be loud. Ask to see your scans. Ask about the molecular profile. Ask about clinical trials. Every time there's a change, every time something looks worse, comment, C-O-M-E-T, conventional therapy. Is there a surgical option? O, M, molecular. Is there some sort of molecular-based option I can use? E, everything else. What about radiation? What about lit? What about the ultrasound sorts of trials? What about all this stuff that's going on? T, trials, clinical trials. Let's talk about it. Let's tell me what's up. Tell me what's out there. I want you asking your physician every single time. The journey for all of you may be different, but that thought process, planet Earth, right? Backing all the way out, that playing chess thought process is the same. Your trees might be different, but when you back out into the forest and you back out into the country and you back out into the, 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 the continent and you back out into planet Earth, that thought process is the same. And I want you to take it with you. Inches matter and there's lots of right ways to do this. Come back for reference if you need to. Thanks for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you for spending your day with us. This is actually my twin boys when they were young. This is actually a cartoonist. They just did this for me recently based on this picture. It's pretty interesting. And then, you know, we have this series every week. This is the GBM talk. I hope you appreciate it. Please go back to that very first talk, the one that says how to optimize your ability to fight cancer to get the kind of background behind this one. But I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you so much. We'll take questions. Awesome. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Um, how uh, could how will someone know if they're not in the right trial? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, is there a way to know that? I know you're kind of playing, it's, it's very <laughs> risky to place them in a trial, but what if I am not making any progress? Can I move out of one trial into another one based on what my doctor says? Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to answer that very loaded question as, as much as I want to. I think that you know, yes, to, to the, the answer to that question is, if the trial is not going well, the disease is getting worse, you will come off trial. Like that's built into the trial. They're okay. not going to keep doing it if it doesn't work. So the trials are very regimented. They have to be for multiple reasons. These companies, their first priority is always patient safety, right? It's not so much getting the drug approved. That's obviously a secondary concern. That's obviously a big deal for them. But their first priority, and I run two national clinical trials and medical director two trials, I can guarantee you our first priority is always patient safety, right? And so if the trial is either making a patient sick in a way that it should not be the drug, or it's not working, there are built-in measures to assess response very quickly and you would just come off. So that's built into the trial. Okay. And is there a, a time period that we should allow for when participating in a trial? Your questions are so brilliant. Yeah, so that's built into the trial. It's typically very quick. Like they, you know, in a case like this, probably two months, they'd be checking six, six weeks. So they're, they're very fast with response assessments, Ollie. So you wouldn't have to do anything sooner unless something changed. If something were to change, let's say you have new headaches or something's crazy is going on, they would do scans, right? They treat you like they would anyways. Right. But in general, they're doing these response assessments incredibly fast, even faster than we would no do normally because they want to know if something's happening. And so it tends to not be an issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ali, amazing questions. Anyone else have anything? Okay, well, thank you for spending your day with us. This will be on YouTube eventually. I appreciate everyone's time. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. We'll see you later. Take care. Thank you.